Hi, I'm your host, Scott, Dr. GX Goldfine, welcoming you to another episode of Where'd You Get Your Funk From? Shout out to PTFI for the funky theme music. Be sure to check out his new 2024 releases. Since this podcast was recently launched following many years of my work on the acclaimed Truth and Rhythm show, allow me to review the format. Where'd You Get Your Funk From focuses on the here and now with a broad range of creative and artistic guests sharing fascinating stories, experiences, and perspectives. It's a welcoming avenue to newer and independent musical acts, as well as established and still active musicians of any genre. Also authors, filmmakers, actors, artists, collectors, and archivists, radio and podcast personalities, journalists, scholars, sound techs, promoters, photographers, and other creative people. A common thread is the show's standard opening question, where'd you get your funk from? This is much deeper than it may seem, as the answer need not be strictly about funky music, and in fact, not everyone has even found the funk. It could hit on whatever type of music touches their soul or pleasure centers. Additionally, the question extends beyond music. Paraphrasing George Clinton, funk is whatever it needs to be to get you over the hump. Thus, guests can explain where they got their grit, perseverance, inspiration, talent, creativity, character, or other qualities that shape them into who they are today. This serves as a springboard into candid, in-depth conversations. With that, let's get to it. One. I'm delighted to welcome a longtime friend and fellow Funketeer, Tim Kinley, to this edition of Where'd You Get Your Funk From? He's one of the foremost advocates and archivists dedicated to supporting and honoring everything and everyone associated with the Parliament of Funkadelic Thing and P-Funk mastermind George Clinton. That includes primary cohorts like Bootsy Collins, Bernie Worrell, Gary Scheider, Eddie Hazel, and many dozens more, as well as groups like Parliament, Funkadelic, Bootsy's Rubber Band, Parlette, Brides of Funkenstein, and Fred Wesley and the Horny Horns. Tim, thank you for being here, man. How are you? Hello, 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 Scott. Thank you for bringing me here to this, this, this you know, I almost felt the little wars in the background. It's almost like hollow ground, you know? I like that. Yeah, we got to bring the, we're bringing the Carolinas together today. This is it. That's right. And and we, we do this because we now know George Clinton has South Carolina roots. So now, North and South Carolina can have joint jurisdiction over George Clinton. Isn't that nice? <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, I'm just a stone's throw from Kannapolis. So, I how I've that worked out. Yeah. Yeah. I've been to Kannapolis just once. And I was like, wow, I'm feeling the vibe. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, you've been to uh, the Jersey, the Plainfield, though. I haven't been, I haven't been there. Yeah. But I haven't been there uh, in, in a while. And I haven't been there since they put up that street. Mm. Uh, the problem in front of the street name. I have to go in front of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely for sure. Just, just, just like just going like, to the mothership. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, just like I'm sure you want to go back to the West Coast and take a picture of that star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. You bet. Yeah. You know. Yep. Absolutely. So, uh, Tim, the um, the format of the show is a little bit different. The first question I ask is the title of the show. So, and it's got two parts. The first part is where'd you get your funk from in terms of, you know, what brought you to funk music? And the second part is where'd you get your funk from in terms of, you know, who Tim Kinley is, you know, your character, your attitude, your perseverance, you know, the fabric of Tim Kinley, where'd you get that from in terms of your funk? So we're going to talk so much about the funk, obviously, because we're going to talk about everything related to P-Funk, but um, just, you know, kind of in a nutshell, even if it's before, you know, you got your first Parliament album or whatever, you know, where'd you get your funk from initially, Tim? Like probably, I guess where all people get their funk from is their parents. My parents were born in Elkin County, South Carolina. A place that I frequent a lot. My mother was still alive. So, you know, most people want to go back to where they, where they, where they grew up at, you know. And I probably didn't take a, advantage of it as like, as a have, but I'm glad I went and saw the birthplace of my parents up close and personal. Um, I think I didn't realize this until I got older. You know, my father was a big Louis Jordan fan. And I didn't really understand 
it was Jordan until maybe in t- going into the 80s. And I didn't understand that Louis Jordan was kind of like a lineage brought you from Louis Jordan to James to Sly. That is when, I guess that's the, the case with most people. They don't understand their parents' music until they get a little older. And it's, and, and, and it's like, oh, now I get it. And, and, and that's how it was with me. You know, I started listening to a lot of Blues Jordan, you know, in my uh, around the uh, 1980s, early 90s. I really started to understand the connection between someone like Blues Jordan. A lot of similarities there that I don't think a lot of people uh, draw enough. So that was one way that I was uh, put on this particular path to where I am. Okay. And did you buy much music before you first got P-Funk? No, I did not. I was... I wasn't really into music. I mean, early on, I, I remember having the 40, couple of 45s. I think may, one of them may have been uh, the Jackson 5. I, de- I definitely remember one of them was Become the Judge by Shorty Long. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, I really dug that record. But for a while, right after that, I wasn't really into music until the disco and dance era came. So when that happened, you know, I snuck around the corner to my um, friend's house. This was in the spring of 1970. Uh, I went around, I snuck around the corner, hung out with my my friends. They were playing all the top hits of the day. To this day, I can remember the exact sequence of that tape. I remember that the very first song was Dance with Me by Peter Brown. Oh, dance club. Second song was Flash. That's the song on that tape that stopped me dead in my chair. Asked what the hell is the song? I kept asking them over and over and over. Yeah, I don't think I ever got tired of hearing that song because I never heard, I never heard a groove executed in the way that you find on the song. So you know, I bought that forty-five. Um, then, my, you know, I was graduating to uh, high school. And my sister was graduating to tenth grade. So my so we got a, a new stereo system. I got a like a little boombox as, as a gift, and my older sister gave my second younger sister a bunch of albums to break that stereo. And one of those records was a Bootsy Player of the Year. And when I saw it, I was like, "This is a really nice album cover." This, I'm sure the album, you know, this is really nice. And then I started to read the names. I guess I don't know why why, why I, I was so intrigued with the with the at that age, but I was, and I saw, and I was reading it. And I was like, okay, the same names that are on this Player of the Year album are on that Parliament flashlight scene. I was like, there's got to be a connection. I didn't, I didn't know the connection. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't aware of the connection until very later on in the year, because after all of that. You know, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, um, Howard Squares and Funk and Telkey were played pretty regularly on the radio during the summer of 1978. I was like, this, this is like this. I, I, I don't know if we can get any better than this. And then September came and One Nation. And I was like, who is Funkadelic? I just thought Funkadelic was a band that George Clinton was producing at the time. I didn't know the connection. Between both Parliament and Funkadelic, until one time I went to a, uh, a record store and I was looking and I was looking at the record, like who's, who's Funkadelic? Who, who's Funkadelic? And the, and the guy behind the counter was like, he was real simple, like yo, oh man, Funkadelic, same band. Okay, <laughs> now I know. <laughs> okay, it was, it was so simplistic. You know, such a such a big discovery, drawn from something so simplistic. So by that, so okay, so right after that, they dropped. Uh, Aqua Boogie, Motor Booty Affair, and I was like, okay, this is it. There's no turning back. Yeah, yeah. I spent the, I spent the next year scouring the record. But I'm sure you know, at that time, those P Funk records were all in the, the, uh, the discount bins. Yeah, yes, cut out bins for like $2.99, $1.99. Yeah. 
you could, I don't know if there was a better time to be a Funketeer because they were hitting on the radio, they were hitting at the concerts, and you could get their music totally cheap at the record store. I don't think you can get a better situation than that. By that point, I was like, there was this yeah. luck time. All right, I'm going to cut you off there because we'll get back to that. But before okay. we do, um, where'd you get your funk from in terms of Tim Kinley? Because, you know, I know that you're a principled individual, which is another thing I really admire and like about you. Um, and sometimes, you know, you'll use your alter ego, if you will, and on social media as Timothy Kinley, and you'll have some, you know, opinionated posts. So yeah. where'd, you, where'd you get that foundation from, Tim? Where'd you get that part of your... You know, I'm not a very politically minded person, but I guess the, uh, the atmosphere of the times and how it evolved had a pretty profound effect. I just started to see certain situations in a particular way, and I'd never, I don't know if I've ever been proven wrong about my beliefs about it, but I connected with those situations in such a way that it put me on a more progressive path and it put me into uh, it connected me to people that were definitely devoted to a more progressive political uh, position and I really respected what they had to say I always I'm always going I'm always going to be open to, you know to um, hearing different points of view. And whoever is more convincing, I guess I just go in that direction. But I'm always going to hear, you know, both sides of the issue. And at the moment, I don't see myself. I don't come. I don't think I'm uh, a left individual. But I am. I like to think that I would be devoted to a progressive state of mind. You know, and that progressive state of mind is probably the reason why I've embraced people in the, in the way that I do. The way that I, uh, I've uh, uh, um, raised people like Fela or Gusta Heron, which I, you know, I can't, I can't describe how heartbreaking it was to see Gil Scott Heron die on my birthday. The man that I just, I, he just opened my eyes to so many things. And to have him die on my birthday was just so, it, it hit me real deep. And I'm sure, you know, I know you're deep into as well, so I know when his died, you were affected just as much as I was affected. But, 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 the, but the fact that because it was on my birthday, I really hid. So that's what uh, guided me toward a frame of mind and a frame of mind of trying to help other people or at least assist other people, which is the reason why I jumped into a life devoted to assisting. The developmentally disabled population. So, and then and I'm still doing it now. In fact, I guess I could say I'm working with the one client that I know more than any other client that I've ever worked with. I'm, I'm all right where I'm at now. So, I could, I would love to get some more hours, but I can, I'm right now, I'm good. I'm all right. Okay. Well, it gives you more time to uh, listen and look at P Funk, I guess. <laughs> you know, oh, yes, that's you got that right. At least write about it. Yeah, we write about. It. I'm not, you know, I'm trying to follow in your footsteps. <laughs> you know, I'm not, you, I remember you, uh, you know, writing those articles. What magazine was it again? It was a magazine in LA. Yeah, LA it was. A, it was um, <laughs> what was that magazine called, man? Wow, man! You, you, <laughs> um, you don't know? You don't remember? It will come back to me. Uh, it's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I forgot that one. Um, but the title was my dinner with Dr. Funkenstein. That I right. remember. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So going back to that magic, yes. that, ma that magical initial spark of flashlight, you know, because I was already into P funk for a few years at that point. Um, I got in mm -hmm. on mothership connection. Um, but, um, you know, I'll, it's forever in my brain cells, <laughs> you know, am I, soul and every fiber of me i feel like when i first heard flashlight i mean i was already deep into it for you it was like kind of like new getting into the funk mm -hmm, but for mm -hmm, me mm -hmm. i was already deep into it and even then it was like nothing else that had come before it so i just couldn't get enough of it and it was just like this thing is unreal and 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 on top of that 
it was nothing like anything else you were hearing on the radio. Correct. Oh yeah, and, and it was mind blowing, completely. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and and think about that. You were still you were already into it, and it still had pretty much the same effect on you that it had on me. To this day, I I just don't. I don't know if I've ever heard music. To, that, that that you know executed in that way. I just don't know. I don't even all of the other funk uh, arts that came after P funk. I just don't know. I don't think I can point to somebody that did something on the level of Flash. That's one of those moments where I mean, like what what, what was it? Um, Shock, Shock G of Digital Underground. You know, first thought that Flashlight just sounded like somebody making a song about an object. Now that we now that we know the concept behind that album, Funk Intelligence versus the Placebo Syndrome, we know that it's more than just an object. You know, it's a it, it, like you said, it's not a noun, it's a verb, it's an action. And I, and, and I don't know if I've ever come across a record. What was that? Really, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. No, no, what, what added to it, the impact for me too was. It wasn't played on the radio yet because Bob Gem was the single. And so right. I had the album and I played it all the way through. And the last track I came to was Flashlight. And so the fact that it kind of came out of nowhere when I first heard it, I'm like, how could this not be what they're blowing up on radio right now? You know, now, you know? So, uh -huh. it was just so it was so obvious, you know. Um, I see that. That's the thing. I never heard Bob Gem on the radio when it was out. Uh, I think BLS jumped right to Flash, you know, and well, um, L.A. What are you gonna do? That's it. That's right. What? What was it? KDIA? Did you heard it? What? What? Was, what um, KDAY. Oh my, okay, I'm all right. Oh, KDA. Okay, okay. All right, all right. So Tim, Funk and Telekey was the first album you had by P Funk. Is that right? That's the first one I bought. Yeah. So, tell me, and how old were you? Fourteen. Okay. So tell me about young Tim looking at that comic book and looking at that package and hearing those sounds and, you know, what was it doing to young Tim? Young Tim, because he had already grown up in New York City and was already used to seeing graffiti on, uh, on, on the subway, subway walls and on the subway trains, was deeply... Uh, enthralled at the artwork that uh, that Overton Lloyd did for the comic book because it had that kind of New York City graffiti flair to it. That's what made it so appealing to me when I heard it. So listening to this album while I'm absorbing the images in this comic book was just the you know it was like how much icing can you put on one cake, right? <laughs> you know, it's it's just ridiculous. This uh, it, not many people give you, you know, the, uh, a visual and musical turn on at the same time, unless, you know, they're like, a, 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 you know, a very attractive singer that, you know, that, that's, that's usually, that's usually the case. Not with this. It's, you, you're, you're, in, you're, you're, you're like diving into this ridiculous storyline and it, and yet it's, it's, it's a ridiculous storyline, but it helps to make sense it helps in that it makes sense of the, of the of the entire album when you listen to it, you know. And that's and, and by the way, that is the one thing the um, excuse me, the um, CDs, as you well know, you know the CDs didn't have the like that the Funk and CD didn't have the the comic book. So anybody buying this, any younger uh, generation Funketeer enjoying this music doesn't have the benefit of that comic book that helps them to explain the concept behind the album you know and, um, and also create that total immersion say i'm sorry say again this and also create that total immersion experience exactly exactly the only thing that was missing from this experience which i kind of regret is was not being able to go to the funk atelier concert at Madison Square Garden, because I know if I would have done if, if that if, if I would have done that, I don't I don't know what my 
I don't know what my young 14-year-old mind would have been able to process after seeing a concert like that. Yeah. So when you were collecting all these other uh, P-Funk albums, like I did, uh, were you, did you find it all accessible right away? Or was there some Funkadelic that was kind of too far out there and took you a while to kind of catch up to it? No. Everything that I went and bought, I embraced and loved the first time I heard it. And I guess because Funkadelic's greatest hits was the first Funkadelic album I ever bought, even before One Nation, it helped me to understand how homegrown, how organic, uh, and how street oriented Funkadelic was. So when I so by the time that I got the original albums, I understood it completely, you know. And, I, and it's very interesting. I didn't, I wasn't into smoking weed or or, or any other trendy chemical of trendy chem, chemical substance that was around or prevalent at the time. I was just listening to the music just, uh, you know, and, and I got, uh, I got high just on the strength of the music itself, you know? And I think to this day, a lot of people are, you know, they, when I tell them that I don't smoke weed, it's like, are you going to be into P-Funk and not smoke weed? Which I, 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 in one way is kind of a little bit insulting, but and then again, I understand why people would, you know, light up when try and then listen to say ultra wave through headphones. I'm sure it's going to give you a ridiculous experience. Mm -hmm. So, what was yeah. the first time you ever saw them, Tim? The uh, Red Parrot, New York City, March twenty fourth, nineteen eighty three. I have a feeling that because of P-Funk's bad reputation at the time, that was the only um, that was the only venue willing to take a chance on them, which was which, which doesn't re, you know they, they that was to their detriment because the Red Parrot was not a really big place, you know. And we I went there and we were packed. I don't know. I'm pretty sure um, that in our you know dealings, I think I may have sent you. The Red Parrot, New York City team? I'm not sure. I'm not sure either at this point. So. <laughs> That's all right. Um, uh, and, but, you know, if you listen to that tape, you can hear it multiple times. Maceo telling the crowd to back up, back up, because it was just that crowded. It was ridiculous. You know, if P-Funk's reputation wasn't so bad, the, like two years before, they probably would have gigged at a place like the Ritz, which is much more... Uh, which, which which would have made much more sense for them to perform at, mm -hmm. um, but the and the but the Red Parrot was way too small. Even with the two shows that they did, they still filled up that place both times. And I think promoters, um, they, I guess they they got a lesson from that because the next year when they came back, they were at the Ritz and it was perfect, uh, you know, a, a, a absolutely perfect evening. But the Red Parrot blew my mind completely. You know, I thought to myself, you know, I, I'm all right, I'm not seeing a mothership, but I'm getting uh, what what can only be described as a smoking funk experience. And then on top of all of that, you know, after I'm 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 you know I'm I'm immersed in funk so deep, here comes Bootsy in the middle of the show. That part just blew people away, you know. So it was just a it was just a fantastic night all around of uh, an experience I'll never forget. Obviously I'll never forget it because I, you know, we were, I was, I, uh, it was, I, I, my friend of mine recorded the show and I listened to that tape to the point where I almost popped, <laughs> you know? Did Booty so, only do a uh, body slam or did he do that, something else? Yeah. That was it. Just body slam. But the, but, but the thing, but the interesting thing was when they came back the second time, uh, they, that, that gig was on a Thursday. They came back the following Tuesday without Bootsy, which enabled the band to stretch out on a lot of other songs. In fact, I think they did Mothership Connection the second time, whereas the first time they didn't do that. So that was really nice to hear that. Well, I saw him in a bigger venue at the Beverly Theater that was captured, of course, on that record. But um, it was one of the loudest shows I ever saw. And the Beverly Theater is a decent size. So I can only imagine how loud that show must have been at that venue. Oh, you know, it wasn't that loud. Really? 
No, no, when I think about it, you know, I, yeah, you know, I was, I was kind of surprised. It was loud, definitely, but it wasn't loud to where my ears were ringing, uh, you know, for the next couple of uh, uh, of nights, a couple of days. So, yeah, it was, it, it was loud, but it was, re- it was fantastic. So, I guess, so you're saying that you will, that you heard a lot of stuff on that Beverly Theater CD that you didn't hear when you saw them live because it was that loud. Now you're now you really heard the show. Yeah, there is some element to that for sure. Yeah, because at the at, at the venue when it was happening, it was so loud that it was feeling like it was getting like to a distortion level at parts. Especially like during Cosmic Slop when you had all the guys, you know, really hitting it. And uh it was like, well, this is almost getting like just too loud, you know? But uh yeah, so it's really good to hear it a little more leveled out on the recording for sure. Right, right, right. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Okay, uh, that that's interesting, isn't it? Nice when you when when a, a, a performance, a P Funk performance, is officially released and it's at a gig you were actually at. That's just ridiculous. Yeah, it is. You know. <laughs> so, what was your first show? Uh, first one was, um, I think the first one was. The Starwood, Rides of Funkenstein, and P-Funk, one of the all-time great shows. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that, I know that must have said that. And, and, and no one's ever thought about, you know, re- releasing that that recording, if one exists, because I'm, I'm sure, you know, one has to exist. Oh, that'd be a dream if uh, that's out there and gets out yeah. somehow, for sure. Absolutely. And the second time I saw him was, I think, the Santa Monica Civic. So, yeah, I missed the mothership because um, I'm sure I shared this with you before. You heard it before, but just in case, uh, it's kind of a sore subject with me. But I had a ticket oh. to the Coliseum in the L.A., and a friend of mine bought them for our group, and he let another friend have my ticket. Oh, wow. And I actually chased that friend down to try to get I chased him up onto a roof. It was crazy. Yeah. And Good so, God. Yeah, I missed it because of that. But I also saw Bootsy in seventy, the Monster Player of the Year. So it was all right around the same time. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's. That, I, I can only imagine how that Bootsy how Bootsy's uh, concert was. That was like I've never seen a tighter band for sure. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, see, that's the thing. I'm, I'm so glad, you know, you were able to do that. I was, I would have loved to have gone to see them at the garden in 77 or 78, but you know, I wasn't really doing great in school. Uh, so I was, you know, they, they, you know, and it would have been nice, you know, I, cause I had older brothers and it would have been nice if one of them would have taken me to, to those shows. That's probably the only reason why I would have been able to go and, you know, but it just didn't happen, you know? So all that I have, to to make reference to is the Parliament Live album and all the all the boots that we've collected over the years from that golden period. Did you realize in your fandom at that time that uh, something had happened with the Funk Mob and the, and the Mothership? You know, right around that eighty one period. I had read I read articles about how things were starting to come apart. And I was very disappointed that something so joyous, some, something so joyous, something so magical, was coming down to a you know a very sad end. But at least when they were able to come back with Atomic Dog, that gave me some hope, you know, because I'm sure you know going through going through the '80s, um, there was some that was some lean times, yeah. you know. And there were some other fun groups that were trying to, you know, to fill the void, but you can't fill a void called P Funk. There's no, it's impossible. You just have to wait until they come back. And sure enough, back in you know, 1989, they came back. I saw them at the Apollo. I, I was supposed to I was supposed to have been at that Palladium show, but you know, that you know, there was a, that there were there were some things that messed up that were beyond my control. So I couldn't go to that Palladium show. But I did make it for the Apollo and they turned that thing out. And I and it's something I always talk about is the fact that 
I, I don't think Maceo was billed, but he was there, blew the roof off. And then, you know, at the end of the show, he walked out with the audience. And I was like, okay. And that, and, and, and that one act showed me how much funk was uh, the soundtrack of the people. It was really the music of the people. It was really the music, I have to say, of the have nots. You know, for somebody as, as legendary as Maceo to walk out with the audience after the show, I was I, I just thought to myself, I don't know if I can be associated with a a more a more down to earth homegrown band than P Funk. Mm -hmm. You know? So well speaking of that, when did you first try to ever go backstage or meet any of them? That was ninety two. Because I had hooked up with a guy. I think I don't know if you ever dealt with him. His name is Charles Blass, oh, yeah. and he knew the pr the promoters, and they wanted to show like a a a, a, um, a like a, a video collage to show before the show. And he knew that I had a lot of videos, so he's like, you know what? Why don't you put up a, 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 a video together, and you know, and, and that way, you know, they they'll give you a pass, and you can get backstage and all this other stuff, and. I met George at that. I saw George at the the Ritz, but we, there was no kind of formal meeting. You know, I I I met the band. I started meeting the band around 1984 when they played the Roxy, which is a a show I wish you had uh, been able to see. That was ridiculous. I don't know if I ever told you about that show. That was a, a gig in which Skeet was late, so at one point. Lodge was doing bass at one point. Gary was doing bass. Uh, and then it, it, it was kind of like going, you know, like kind of teetering on the brink. Then Skeet shows up and, and locks it in completely. It was the only show that I was able to hear Last Dance Live. It was the only gig where I've ever heard that song. You know, I don't know. Did, 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 did they make it out to L.A. For, for the 84 tour? I don't believe so. Oh wow! Yeah, because that one video I forgot where it's at. You probably remember uh, that's a video. Uh, it's in Houston, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's just gold for me because I didn't get to see that tour. Oh yeah, that was a. It was an extremely short tour, tour, but it was a, also extremely organized, extremely tight. Oh wow! I I don't I I'd have to say even with Skeet being late, I don't know if I can put one gig over the other in terms of between the Ritz and the Roxy. The Ritz and the Roxy shows were just amazing. Totally amazing shows. T totally tight. I mean, they what was it? That night they did, what was it? Uh, they did Atomic Dog for what seemed like 45 minutes. And thankfully I recorded, so I know it was 45 minutes because it was long. They they, they did a... a, a um, they had Skeet solo. They had Dennis solo, and 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 it, it was just amazing, ridiculous. And of course, now I don't have that tape that tape anymore. But I another tape. I I literally taped until it. I really played until it popped. Um, but yeah, uh, you, you mentioned about the uh, eighty one period being a bummer and uh, having to get through that when. You know, because we were spoiled. Let's face it, we were totally spoiled. Yeah, uh, true. And. and uh, <laughs> But when Atomic Dog came, I felt close to how I felt about Flashlight when Atomic Dog came. Not quite the same level, but Atomic Dog was pretty, also, it was on that plateau that really only P-Funk can hit, you know, where mm -hmm. it was something that was so new and so fresh and just so right in the P, like, it, you know, I mean, it just, and it was a similar thing where it wasn't the lead single, and you know, Loopzilla was the lead single, right, and right. you know, I'm playing the album, and I hear it on the album for the first time that way, and I'm like, how can this not be <laughs> single? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think a lot of people, I I, uh, I know a lot of my uh, a lot of my friends, you know, when 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 it was a hit, I was saying this is going to go to number one. They were like, Nah, man, you know, Michael Jackson got got the, got, got that chart on lockdown, and what happened? I go to the library, check Billboard magazine. Number one, I was like, that's it. 
I'm this is like a it was like a you know it's like being on Gilgan's Island. It was a rescue attempt. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was just um, it, when that record dropped, I was I was like, oh, thank God. Yeah. You know, you, you know it. You know how it is. You when you you hear all these other records on the on the radio and they're coming close to the funk, but then you hear Tom and Dolan is like, this is exactly what needs to be heard. This is the type of record that needs to be played on black radio every hour, <laughs> you know, like light like flashlight was. Yeah. So uh, tell the people, Tim, how you progressed to, um, you know, putting out like a newsletter and, and things like that in the eighties. I was, uh, I, I, I tell you the minute I, 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 um, discovered P-Funk was the time that I started high school, high school of art and design, right across the street from art and design was a newsstand. One, I don't know what it was, I guess, obviously because they were, they were hot hitting at the time. Um, I saw a whole bunch of magazines, uh, not, a whole, not a whole bunch, but a couple of magazines that had George in the cover. And I was, and, and, and it was so photogenic on these and, and so colorful on the cover of these, these, uh, these magazines that I said, you know, what? I want to get every one of them. And that just started it off The start. It's, that collecting the magazines extended into collecting memorabilia, extended into collecting magazine articles or ma magazines from, from before I discovered them. Uh, and just, you know, everything other than the records, because I knew the records were coming out, but I wanted to get something outside of that particular phenomenon. So I wanted to get, you know, into, I wanted to embrace everything else that was happening at the time, all those magazine articles, all the, uh, you know, um, uh, interviews that he may have been done, doing on radio, stuff like that. And it just grew and grew and it continues to grow to this day. Unfortunately, I, I in the move to to down here in uh, South Carolina, I lost a lot of very valuable uh, pieces of memorabilia. But I've also been able to, in the, in that same time, get other pieces of memorabilia. I don't I don't think I've ever thought I would ever have. You know, because I mean, like you just said, those gold and platinum records are expensive. They are not cheap, regardless of where you get them from. And I was, I fell into a situation where I could actually afford the gold records that I have now, as well as other pieces of memorabilia that I didn't have previous. What What would you say is your top three favorite pieces that you have? <sighs> the magazine I just got today is up there because it was something that. I, it was something that I have been looking for for quite a while. I saw it once on eBay and it, and I, and it let slip to my fingers and it came up recently. And I just had to grab it. It's just, it's, it's just a fantastic uh, piece because I don't think this is, I don't, I don't remember ever seeing P-Funk on the cover of a music magazine in Japan during the hit era. So that's so, what, that, what, that, what year is that, Tim? 1979. Right around the time of Glory, I was stupid. It looks so, to be in great condition, too. Yes, it is. Whoever had this magazine took very good care of it, and that's what I like. You know, um, that I, I could put up there. I guess I could put up there. Uh, let's see, the the flex, the red flexi disc. The, I'm sorry, hold on. the red flexi disc from 1976, Clone mm -hmm. Communicata. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, you know, that's a, an amazing, another ma amazing, ridiculous find. Where people uh, know you, you, you would get it through the fan club, but yeah, they were not a lot of them. No, there wasn't, you know, um, that, uh, the, uh, American Eastern Song survival guide. That's an, that is a, a, a truly amazing piece. So that, so if I had to put, if I had to put them some things up at the top echelon, of the of the archives, those are it. Yeah, I'm sad to say I don't even have the uh, Americades It's Young poster. Oh yeah! Oh wow! Yeah. So why well, you and you never wanted to go on eBay to try and find one? I'm not big on the eBay stuff. Um, 
but uh and and also i have more than i can put up and everything you know how that is uh exactly and your wife you know you probably you know can only tolerate but so much stuff <laughs> all right but like you i suffered some losses in moving from the the west to the east coast too you know it's heartbreaking but uh really 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 uh really valuable stuff huh well, some of my signed covers they got water damage and things like that because i had them in the garage until I could figure out where they're going to go in the the new house. And the garage had some water leakage. So, yeah. Oh, that's, oh my, I'm so I'm sorry about that. Thanks. Wow. Believe me, I can, I believe me. I, you know, I really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so in the eighties, uh, aside from that, well, that was also the uh, golden age of uh, tape trade lists. Huh, yes. Uh, that remember- was the- what year do you think it was maybe that you got your first or I don't know if maybe you created your own before you saw anyone else's. Yeah. I guess because those, those, those red parrot. Uh, okay. The red parrot show, the, um, the, uh, what was it? The Dayton, Ohio, 1981 show, which I actually taped when it was broadcast. Uh, the 80, the 84 shows at the Ritz and the Roxy. I didn't. I, I wasn't into any. I wasn't into any tape training because I didn't know anybody else that had any tapes until I went to a, the mall in uh, Monmouth, uh, in Monmouth County. I went to the mall and some guy was out there selling tapes, like videotapes, and I and and one was labeled Parliament, and I was like, "Could I watch this for a minute?" And he put it and he put it in, and it was the um, eighty three uh, DC show, the Capitol Center. And, and and I was like, oh my God, I know this this because I, I had the audio of that video before I ever saw that video. And that video was done one day after the Red Parrot show. So the uh, so I, I told I, I in fact the, the guy that was that ha- handled this the stand wasn't there. His girlfriend was. So I t- you know, we we got into we got to talking and he gave me some more tapes, and that's how I saw the um the 84 show at in Houston you know which I would love to know what the the, the name of the venue was that's the one thing I never found out because that venue was pretty impressive it was a big stage I know that much yeah for a club yeah yeah you know but um and then after that I discovered the new funk times I just I'm sure you all you also a subscriber and that's how I got to uh, meet a whole bunch of people here, here in the states, and also in Europe. And uh, you know, and that's in fact, it was through the New Funk Times that I met. Um, what was his name? Genius, Genius Spicker from Germany. Yeah, he. Uh, we we started. Doing a lot of t- he started ordering a lot of tapes from me, and and uh, we 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 had, we developed a great friendship. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, and I, it really breaks my heart that he isn't. I first met him at the J- July Fourth uh, show at Central Park in '96. Were you there? No. Oh wow! No. But you wanted to go though, of course. Of course. Yeah, because they didn't do that in, in L.A. You know. So what the, what what kind of a setup did they have in LA? I'm I'm going to assume Bernie wasn't there by the time they got to LA. Well, there, I mean, it, yeah, no, it wasn't anything like what you guys got out there. Oh wow! Yeah. Was there any, was there even a mothership? No. Wow. They didn't bring the mothership to LA. Not in the nineties. Wow, that's that's ridiculous. Yeah. So you were very lucky that way. Yeah, I, I guess I was. Yeah, you know. Um, but, yeah, that, oh, okay. I, I want to let the people know uh, when we first met, though. So I would say it was probably 89, right? When we first met face-to-face? No, no, first met, period. Oh, oh yeah. Um, I think, I don't know how I got in touch with you, but I knew you only through that magazine article that you wrote, My Dinner with Dr. Funkenstein. Yeah, so somehow you reached out to me. Uh, yeah. It was before. That's before the internet, right? Yeah, it's before the oh, internet. Oh yeah, 
Yeah. Oh yeah, this, this, this was before all that. Um, Did you uh, yeah, send I, me I, a I, letter or call me. I don't remember. Yeah, it, you might have been in the in, in New Funk Times as well. I mean, I gotta check those back issues, but I, I think I my, I got your name because I I mean I made up a list and sent it to a lot of people in the New York in, in the New Funk Times, and that's how I got to you know meet a lot of people and you know connect with a lot of people here and and, and, and worldwide or at least you know. Europe and Japan. <laughs> and we started talking pretty regularly on the phone. And I remember, oh, so, you know, you impressed me so much. You were just so into it and so enthusiastic. And likewise. Just, that's know? what I'm exactly. When you, when you find somebody that's just as passionate about a subject that you're passionate about, it, it, oh my God, you can talk forever like we're doing now, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and, and it was just ridiculous. I used to call you when I was at the, when I was, I, I was working at the camp at uh in, in new jersey oh, cursed. I, yeah yeah that's right and i was calling you from a payphone a lot of times <laughs> you know because i didn't have a phone at the time and then and then i got a phone later on but yeah that was uh a ridiculous that was that was some ridiculous times <laughs> yeah well and i had never even been to the east coast um at that point that's so, right. i mean so it, it was you know really an experience just making a friend on the other side of the country and exactly, you know, uh, so yeah, way before the internet, before, uh, a lot of things. So that was exactly, that was Shoot, I, remember, I, I still remember a lot of your reviews. I remember you dug the hell out of martial law. Um, you thought, you thought, I think you thought it was one of, one of George's greatest singles, which I have to more or less agree with, you know? Yeah. And the disappointment at the time of Cinderella theory. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and and it's a shame because we have such high hopes, mainly because of the Incorporated Thing Band, because that was a solid P funk record. Yeah, and just um, got uh, you know kicked to the curb pretty much by the label. This is true, and I doubt if it will ever be reissued. You know. Yeah, I'm I still have, have, of course, my original vinyl. Uh, I got rid of so much vinyl. I had thousands of vinyls uh, or records, as we call them. Uh, but uh, the, the only ones I kept were all the P-Funk and also all the Prince. Right. Well, why did you lose them? Oh, because of the... Well, why did you lose them? I didn't lose them. I foolishly traded them in to upgrade everything to CDs at that time. And, oh, Lord. But there's no way I was going to part with the P-Funk or the Prince. <laughs> okay i hope not okay <laughs> wow wow okay all right well are you trying to like re replace some of that stuff now or is it just gone i've replaced a few you know okay um yeah but like i said i mean the main thing is the p-funk and the prince yeah i get you exactly and i so when they got together i guess what, what was it? Was it? Do you think it was like somewhat disappointing? Oh, I was very disappointed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a shame because of both of us, I'm sure, had a lot of outtakes from both of those albums that sounded better than what was released. Yeah, well, Paradigm was the one that for the longest time was not released. Was it was finally yeah. on? Yeah, it was finally on. How how late? How late did you have to be before you asked? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Probably one of the yeah one of the few songs on that album I actually lit I actually listened to. Mm. Um, yeah, I know it's you 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 expect the peaks and the valleys if you're going to align yourself long term with any musical artist. That's just a given. I get it. I guess we we had a lot of high hopes, you know, in terms of that whole Prince. Um, Prince P Funk uh, merger. Thankfully, I don't know what was your impression of Tapafunk because I love that record. Oh yeah, no, I love that. That to me was a total return to you know the classic era. Really, I thought it was the best thing since. Um, for me, it was the best thing at least since Glory House Stupid. Oh, okay, exactly, exactly, yeah. and I think it's again. You're right, uh, organic very uh earthy it, it you know the rappers aren't too you know, too much into the record like like it is on smell my finger it's like you got all the people 
that made P Funk the untouchable thing of its day. You got them back in there, and they're and they're and they're operating on all cylinders. That is what you need to have. Yeah, I you know never expected it to be on that level again. Really, I mean, it was hard to after you know Cinderella Theory and Smell My Finger again had its moments, but um, the original recordings of those, I think, you know, were probably better with like less stuff done to them you know exactly but um exactly. yeah tapoa foam man awesome album i love it uh and the songs you know just were stronger i think overall oh, nice. oh absolutely sloppy seconds what was that? i think it was bernie's wife who said that they did three tracks for that record you know bootsy bernie and george and they said and she said that uh sloppy seconds is the least impressive cut of the three and I'm like, if that's the least impressive, you know, forget so where, it. Where are those two tracks? Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Exactly. Um, hold on. Let me just turn this off. Um, so, so let's, okay. um, let's shift forward a little bit, Tim. Um, when, when did you, um, you first, you have a very, uh, popular, um, Facebook page now called Parlo Parlo Funkadelic Mint thing. Yeah. And, uh, before that, you had a different one. Uh, when did you first kind of start the Facebook thing? I got I got into it in two thousand nine. Um, it was it's one of those things, like I, it, it's so kind of embarrassing because of the fact that I went into MySpace at the very moment that MySpace was the uncoolest thing to do, <laughs> you know. So I was like, you know, no, you have, you have to get on Facebook. You have to get on Facebook. So I was like, okay, fine. Um, and I started putting up, I think, you know, I, I, at that time I had a scanner, so I was scanning all these pictures, you know, and, and I didn't really care about it too much. I was like, you know, put it out there and, and let the people enjoy it. And I didn't, I guess I didn't expect the response that I was getting, particularly from, uh, other P-Funk musicians. When I when they started seeing these pictures and like, oh wow, I haven't seen this picture in God knows how long. That's when I thought, you know what? This is something I really want to build upon. I then I went out after that I went to the um what do you call it? It's called the it used to be called the P Funk Universe page. I think it still is. But due to some very unhealthy and very uh detrimental situations that transpired on that page, I got a I thank thankfully got away from it. And Donna and I, who I love more than life itself, uh, we went and made our own page and just brought everybody with us, including yourself, obviously. I'm, I can't have a page and I have Scott Goldfine on it. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> um, and we went in there and and now we're up to like 21. I think uh, we are... At twenty one thousand seven hundred members, I like that. I really, I, I really love the fact that this has grown as much as it has, and and just just as I'm very grateful that you do the truth and rhythm uh, interviews, those are going to be nuggets historically, because people want to go back to those um, those segments, you know, and it be able to hear the history from the people who made the history that were a part of the history. That's the mission, you know, it's a it's labor it. of love for sure. And exactly. And what, exactly. You do, what you do in so many ways is labor of love too, with how you share everything that's uh, touched you on the P-Funk uh, side of things and, and share it through the, the website um, or Facebook. And also, you know, uh, you've done exhibits at the library in uh, South Carolina, Columbia. Um, and, uh, you know, you mentioned about uh, getting uh, hit up by Charles Blass in 92 for some of the videos, but through the years, you've increasingly or more frequently been, you know, uh, contacted by different people, whether to contribute something for, uh, you know, liner notes or different things. Um, can you, are any of those, a couple of those that stand out as particularly um, fulfilling or, uh, uh, you know, great experience that you had? Being uh, uh, a um, uh, a consultant, a co-consultant for the P-Funk documentary was probably the highest 
honor I've been able to embrace. That was a fair, I, I loved working on that documentary. I loved having the, the, um, having the archives be shared through the medium of television. I loved, I, I actually loved, you know, being able to share all that history with Funketeers at large. So uh, that, the VH1 thing, uh, the VH1 Legends segment with George Clinton, uh, that was also a nice thing to be involved with. And a lot of people don't know. I, I don't know if, if, if people even remember the, you know, the, the Legends segment, but a lot of people don't realize that you know they were originally going to have just George and maybe his daughter talk during that particular documentary. They didn't realize, you know, Legends is the type of show that they don't talk to. They're not like the VH ones behind the music where they talk to the elevator operator. They talk to the chauffeur. They talk to anybody with any kind of connection to the main artist. And, you know, Legends was not like that. And so when, when we got to talking, you know, they came up, they came down to the camp and we started talking. And that was that was a time when I told them, you, you need to talk to Bootsy Collins. You need to talk to Bernie Worrell. You need to talk to Gary Scheider. You need to talk to all these other people, you know, in terms of getting a real comprehensive episode. It, you know, so that was another good thing. That was another nice thing to be a part of. That was really nice. But the people in the documentary is probably the eyes on and what year was that? And do you know, like, how people can easily see it? The P from the documentary. Yeah, that so you can tell them right now. On, yeah, I believe it's still on YouTube. Okay. You know, um, I wish it could have came out. I wish it would come. A, I wish it would come out on DVD, and B, I wish it would come out in a longer form than it was than what was broadcast. Because what happened? Un unfortunately, I, I, I don't know if people may understand this but they in the middle of the project they ran out of money to finish it and that's why it sat on the shelf for a number of years and then i think in like 2003 2004 uh independent lens the pbs series uh somehow got a hold of it looked at it and said this is a worthwhile story to tell and and, and it should be broadcast so they, they so they funneled some more money into the project, but when they turned when they took it over, a lot of footage was cut away. So there was footage of Malia Franklin and Shirley Hayden uh, talking about their involvement with the band. That was cut away. Uh, some other stuff was cut away as well. It would be nice if if they did a DVD of the documentary and you know and put it out complete with those added parts that were uh, edited out. Unfortunately, because there's so much music in the DVD, it would be impossible to license a DVD, a, a DVD release for that particular documentary. That's very heartbreaking. Yeah, there's actually several cases of that kind of, you know, legalities affecting what we're able to see and enjoy. Um, a lot of copyright squabbling, you know. Yeah. And so it, it's so, again, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking because that means the people don't get to see a lot of, you know, fantastic performances and they don't see, they don't get to see people speak on the music, the, you know, the art that they were able to create. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, you know, I like, and I know I'm sure I, you know, I made my feelings known about the, you know, the, the other documentary that's, you know, that's streaming right now i i, I it's, that's not representative of the band i don't think you know yeah I'm well, not, that's, that's yeah. the other aspect of it too is i mean you've always been on the positive side and and not you know looking to tear things down and you know really just respecting and supporting you know the p-funk you know world and all the artists and everyone that comprises it and you know what we're you know what value is there in negativity so um no I yeah. don't see. I don't. See, yeah, I don't. I don't see much of a. Uh, I don't see much purpose in it. You know, you. It's this music. Nobody can go back in a time machine and fix what happens. The, you know, a lot of this, the, whatever stuff that happened, it happened. We don't. You know, that happened behind closed doors. That's none of my business. If you, you know, so that has nothing to do with why I bought those records or why I went to those shows. 
and can continue to buy records, those records, and buy and go to those shows. Whatever happened behind closed doors fifty years ago ain't got nothing to do with me. So yeah. I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, uh, um, I'm not gonna reflect on that. I'm just gonna reflect on what I, as to, what has um, direct, what has affected me directly. That's the only thing I care. about. Yeah, I was just thinking and making me laugh, thinking selfishly. You know, I don't really care that much what happened behind those closed doors because the music <laughs> means so much to me and it's been so important in my life. Whatever it took, thank you. You know, thank the the universe for this music. You know what I mean? Of course, and and of course, there was a lot of shit that went went down behind this. You know, uh, behind closed doors. If it if they if it didn't have if that if that didn't happen, what would the music sound like? This music sounds like the the byproduct of a lot of shit that went down, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So at at what point, or was there a point, Tim, where you felt like you kind of went from being this, you know, diehard fan and and just believer in, in P-Funk to really being somewhat of a historian and archivist, you know? And, and, and how fulfilling was that sort of, you know, progression. Uh, I because it was so natural and so uh, seamless. I just looked at it as something, something that has to be done because basically, you know the deal in terms of losing a lot of of uh, a lot of key figures in and out of the band. Those that those were out, those that were out of the band, that were that were trying to help to tell the story and try to document it, and you know we've lost them, we've lost people in the band. You know it, it breaks to my heart to this day that three other the three co consultants for the P Four documentary are no longer with us. That breaks my heart to no end, and I now I feel that it's my duty. It's an obligation to to make sure that younger generations of funketeers know all about this music as much as possible. You know, that's probably the reason why the interview that I did with George did was done the way that it was. I wasn't going to get into anything controversial. I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be music centered. Because that is what people are going to experience above anything above anything else when they when they talk about or deal with George Clinton, Paul and Funkadelic, Bootsy Collins. You're going to deal with the music first, and that's why I wanted to shed a light on how that music was built and how and what what kind of mental framework collectively or individually went into creating this type of magic. I don't you you know it and you you see it yourself and we and I see it from my from my own from my own eyes. Aside from, and I know from from your from your viewpoint, aside from Prince, no one else hits you like George likes to say. No one else hits you on that primal button like P Funk does. Nothing does. No, no other music speaks to me in the way that P Funk does. No other music represents an extension of who I am more than P-Funk does. And that's saying a lot because I know all the, the musical heroes that came before P-Funk, James Brown, Hendrix, Miles, all these other people that came before P-Funk and, 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 and they had their magic, they had their, uh, their their musical mojo, if you will. But for me, P funk is the center of my consciousness P funk represents the center of that. I don't think I can explain it in any other way. Absolutely, I totally relate. I mean, we could dissect it so much, but it's the complexity of it. You know, it's just uh, so many layers uh, musically and social, you know, socially and um, uh, conceptually. Uh, it's just nothing that approaches it, but. Um, you mentioned the George interview. I want to first came Bootsy, right? So Bootsy yes. was in like was was that twenty nineteen or what 20, was 2018. 2018. Okay. So 
let the folks know who may not know you uh, connected with Bootsy and you did an interview with him at the, that was also at the library, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. So how did, uh, how did, what was the genesis of that? Uh, we went to Bootsy's birthday party and well, well let me look, let me, let me uh, re uh, rewind a little bit more. I was, you know, they, they were talking about, you know, people coming to the library and, and, and all this. And I thought to myself, you know what? Wouldn't it be nice to get the people like George or Bootsy here at the library? So they they had a suggestion box of who would like to who they'd like to bring, and I I put in the suggestion I'd like to bring Bootsy. So so a woman that worked at the library who no longer works there. I'm, I'm so sorry she doesn't. Her name was Sarah. She came down, and we talked about it, and he was like, "Well, do you think you can get this person?" And I was like, "I can certainly try." So later that year, that was in 2017. Later that year, Bootsy had a birthday party in Nashville. I don't know why Nashville, but okay. <laughs> um, we, we went down, you know, uh, we, we, we connected with Bootsy. It was great to see him. We were all so happy to see each other. And and I, I talked to him about, about doing this. And he was like, you just talked to Patty and his wife. And uh, his uh, agent, who was, I think his name is Art, Art Oscar Art Ar Arce. I, I don't, I don't know how to pr to not pronounce his last name. Was last his first name was Ar Oscar, and uh, we started talking, and we we kept going, we kept uh, um, keeping in contact, and and when and we we got a contract sent out to him with with the fee for him coming out, they agreed, and he signed it, and I was very shocked. I was like, this is going to actually happen. I can't believe this. So they came down, uh, which was kind of a trying time because my brother had passed away a couple of days before the event. And I think a lot of people were like, are you going to be able to do this gig? And I was like, my brother gave me my first copy of Mothership Connection. So if, if for nothing else, it could be a tribute to him. So he... Um, so, so Bootsy came down and we had a great talk. It was a great night. You know, everybody, everybody left happy. The library was happy. Bootsy left happy. I certainly, the, the people left, left happy. I certainly left happy. It was great. You must've been like pinching yourself a little bit though, that, you know, I mean, from that first exposure to the player of the year album and uh, as a young teen to doing that. You could, I'm sure, well, shoot, have you ever done an interview with Boosie? Yeah, but way back in 82. Oh, okay, okay. Well, well you still did it, though. <laughs> <laughs> you, still, you still got it done. And I probably, I'm, and I'm pretty sure I felt the same way you did. It's just to sit next to this man and hear him talk, you know, to hear him share his stories about James Brown and George. It, it was just, it, it was just, it was just magical. In fact, there's one part of that interview that is not on the YouTube clip. It is so funny because they talk about, uh, first of all, they talk about, he, he talks about how him and Boots, him and George used to share hotel rooms back during the mothership era, which I thought was ridiculous. <laughs> you know, don't, could you imagine? So they, they're sharing a hotel room, but uh, some girl calls up and wants to talk to Boosie, you know, and George gives, put, you know, does his Boosie impersonation like, Oh yeah, this is this is Boosie. Yeah, double 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 Boosie and all those other stuff. And the next thing you know, George is doing his business with that girl that wanted to meet Boosie. <laughs> you know, I thought that was ridiculous. That was that was that was hilarious. I'm glad it was an adult only event because I didn't want want any kids to be in the audience <laughs> to hear something like that. <laughs> that was a great it was a great night though. George uh, impersonating Bootsy that just flashed in my mind about uh, okay. When, it's just stupid. Well, also, I was just thinking when that Bootsy impersonator was making the rounds. Remember that? Story? Yeah, remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, that was ridiculous. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, what was the first uh, pure Bootsy show you ever saw? Nineteen ninety, uh, SOB, uh, September twenty sixth, twenty seventh at SOBs in nineteen ninety. That was a that was another ridiculous show where it was packed to the rafters. Was Bernie with him or no? Yes, he was. Oh, oh, good grief. You would have salivated at the lineup. Bootsy on bass. 
uh, Bernie and Trey Stone on keyboards. Uh, Fred, Maceo, and Kush on the horns. Gary and and Mike on guitar. It was basically, you know, Studio P Funk seventy seven. I just I they that night they didn't even have to play. All I needed to do was just look at them. It was like. This is Studio P Funk seventy seven. This is ridiculous, mm-hmm. you know. And they and they just laid it out, laid it out complete. It was oh, what a night that was! I, I went to both. I was lucky enough to go to both shows. It was just fantastic. Yeah, we we're talking about the eighties being lean years with P Funk, but um, especially with Bootsy from like you know eighty two to eighty nine or whatever, where he was right. just you know MIA. For the most part, you know, a few Laswell sightings, but that was about it. Yes, exactly. And I guess, you know, we had, we, and then we got what's Bootsy doing in 1988. You know, it was something, you know, I was like, okay, you know, and, but I guess what, whatever what's Bootsy doing locked, Jungle Bass made up for it. Jungle Bass is, I love that record, you know? Yeah. It's not a full album, but yeah. No, no, but <laughs> hell. <laughs> it 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 definitely made up for the parts of um of um of what's Boosie doing that you probably didn't listen to, you know, but but definitely that was a you know that was I like the the jungle based thing, you know, and I also dug um, blessings of the universe. That was mm-hmm. a great record, you know, but yeah, you know, I guess the we I, for I don't know for you for, I don't know about for my for you, but for me the nineties. Uh, I, I was able to really um, make up for a lot of lost time that happened during the seventies. You know, I was able to catch up and see all these bands. And you know, my the job that I had, it was just so great because I, you know, most of the time these gigs fell in between the times that I was off that that I, that, I, that I worked. It usually fell right in the middle of the times that I was off. So I was like, I could I could go anywhere. You know, take a you know. I can just jump on a bus, go to this place, go to that place. It was fantastic. Fantastic. One interesting thing was uh, the demographics of the crowds for P-Funk, how much it changed from the 70s to the 90s. Absolutely. Yes. And that's something I saw uh, right from the first time I saw them. Because, you know, it was in New York. It was in a very cosmopolitan area of New York City. And it wasn't like it wasn't at the at the Apollo you know, um, and I, that's what I, I guess it. it, it I, I learned that it really is about location. I would see them in a pretty mixed crowd in New York, but then when I went to Philly, it was blacker than black, and I was like very surprised by that. You know, and I'm not sure. Well, I I, I have my ideas about why the black crowd was so prominent in Philly as opposed to New York. Um, I'm just glad. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. That they hit New York so often the way that they did. I think from 1989 to 90, uh, to an 89, 90, it was a thing where you went and, oh, are you just happy? They, they're, they're back. And, you know, you really wasn't, you really weren't, you know, analyzing the quality of the shows, even though the quality of the shows was pretty nice. But when they came back to uh, the Palladium, on June 25th, 1991, that was where everything changed because they didn't, you know, I, I, it wasn't, the, they didn't open up in the standard way. They opened up with Charlie Funk getting ready to roll. And I was, and I looked at, you know, the, the friend of mine that was with, with me, we both looked at each other was like, wait a minute, what, the, what are these, what are these, what are they trying to pull out now? So they went into that. Then Paul Schaefer from David Letterman's band comes out, stays with them the entire night. Um, they and and then just and they just pull out all the stuff that they didn't regularly, they didn't usually do at the pre or they didn't do it at the previous gigs that I had been to the two nights, the, the two years before. And I was like, something is about to happen. And now I started to see P Funk fans around me and they were looking defiant like, this is P Funk right here. This is not just an oldies band, this is P Funk. This is a vibe that no one else can touch. And from that moment on, I started here. I started seeing shows in which they just kept delving into that catalog more and more and more. And I was like, "Oh, this is fantastic! 
Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, you, you know, you, 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 I know you felt the same way. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I, don't yeah. want just to run through the hits. Want to deep dive into the catalog and some Thank things you. that are unexpected. You know, come out left field with something. Exactly, exactly. And when you and 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 and, and you're like when when they do this, like I'm never missing this band ever again. Whenever this band's in New York or in the tri-state area, I'm there. No questions asked. And that was a great thing about living in Jersey because I was right, I was right in the middle. Where you have New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, I could get to all these shows one way or another, and I, I you know, I love the Jersey crowds, I love the New York crowds, but Philly crowds are crazed. Mm -hmm. Those dudes are crazed. I love going to Philly to see people. Good grief, they those those you know those the the, the Philly crowd you know pushes them on. And they just get they and they give everything back to that crowd. It's just ridiculous. I'm, Philly is just ridiculous. They're just crazed. I love Philly crowds. I love Philly Funketeers. Huh. That sounds like they're sports fans too, the reputation they have, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, don't, I mean, I don't know what 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 uh, situation you are dealing with in terms of uh enthusiastic audiences. I mean, is it, it I mean, where do you see the most enthusiastic audiences? I've only seen shows, you know, in Southern California. So uh -huh. I don't, you know, I don't have uh, multi-state comparisons for P-Funk. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, a lot of times in LA, you know, sometimes they can be laid back, you know, and sometimes they leave early. But no matter what, you know, at a P-Funk show, you're always going to have some of the diehards that are up front and are just completely enraptured for the whole time. You know? okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's why. So, so, did you ever see? Uh, I imagine you must have because there are a lot of them out there too. Some of the um, Woo Warriors shows. I was able to videotape the very first Woo Warriors show. That transpired at at Wetlands Preserve in lower in Lower Manhattan. That was on uh, November 8th, 1996. Fantastic show. Totally ridiculous. So same year as the mothership in Central Park, right? Pretty much, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, because I guess that was the time when Bernie wasn't, wasn't a part of that tour. And he really, you know, focused on his own band, his own unit. And... They were they, they, that's where they started doing the gigs in, in New York and at, at, at Wetlands and some other areas. This only time I got that I met Bernie was after one of those shows. I think it was right around that same might have been ninety six, but at the Strand in Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah, I didn't get to talk to him much. He was very low key. He, he was. He always was. Yeah, he was. But he was a what a sweet man, you know. Mm -hmm. He was such a. Not, you know, I guess kind of like non, I don't want to say non-confrontational, but he just wasn't the type of in your face. He was very, you're right, very reserved, you know, but not standoffish. That's a great thing, you know. In fact, I don't think either one of us have ever, I don't want to maybe speak for you, but I don't think either one of us have ever met a member of the band that rubs you the long way. You know, you like they they were standoffish or they were like, I don't want to bother with you. I, mean, I don't, I don't, I've never had that. No, I haven't. <laughs> some, other, great? So, some others outside of P Funk for sure, but yeah, no. I love, I'd love to hear those stories too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, tell us, tell, Jim, tell us about the uh, genesis for the George Clinton uh, interview, though. That was, uh, we started work on that in 2019. Uh, and uh, you know, all praise due to Archie Ivy, who really helped put that thing together. If it, I, I'm, I don't know if it would have came together if it wasn't for Archie. Um, we were all set to get him down there, and then of course, COVID hit, so we had to wait a couple years. And when and, and when we started coming out of the wilderness of COVID. We reconnected with Archie. Um, Archie loved what he heard, and you know we we um, we got everything together business wise, 
And, you know, we had, and they came down. We had a great dinner the night before. And it was, it was really nice just to have, be in a very natural setting with George and his wife. It was just, that was really nice. That food, we had, you know, I mean, even though the library would pay for the meal, I paid for that meal a lot, you know, a little later on in the day and, and, and a, 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 little, a little later on at night. So it was kind of, oh, <laughs> it was good. It was nice. It was just, you know, it had, had a, had a very adverse effect physically. And then we went, um, we set everything up at the township auditorium, which I didn't, which, and it was, that was a perfect situation. Originally it was going to be a complete COVID uh, awareness thing where we, where you couldn't get in unless you know you uh, showed proof of vaccination, and then the governor stepped in and said, "No, you can't do that." So what we did was we had we had a situation where the event was a general thing, but the meet and greet was uh, COVID um, very COVID conscious. So. It was great to be able to sit down with him for as long as I was able to do and also give Archie some shine near the end of that interview. So, and, 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 you know, after that, it was just, you know, that, that's when, you know, everything just came together and it was a great interview, you know, and, and a great, and also a great meet and greet. And, and you know, as another, another, another example of George and his people leaving happy, the people leaving happy, the library leaving happy. The township auditorium leaving happy. It was just, it was just great all, all all across the board. Yeah, well, congratulations for pulling those off, and you know, on behalf of fans everywhere, thank you for doing it too. No problem, man. It, got, it was a, a a labor of love. It was something I always I always wanted to do. I interviewed I had interviewed George before. I interviewed him back in like ninety four, um, but this is better because it was in front of an, in front of an audience, in front of his fans. And you know it was able, I was you know it was good it was good that you were we were able to talk about some topics that weren't really that that's, that's usually not covered you know like the the background behind Lubzilla the the background behind Knee Deep which he really I love the way he broke down Knee Deep you know that's a that was I I I knew some aspects of of the creative process behind that track but when he broke it down I was like oh okay. Now I now I totally understand it, and that whole part about the opening to Knee Deep being influenced by Teddy Pendergrass, mm -hmm. that blew me away completely. Because I would never, if he had had he not said, that, I would never have made a connection. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Isn't it amazing too how uh, lucid George still is and the recall he has? It's kind of scary. It's kind of ridiculous. Eighty, what is he? What are you now? Eighty-three years old, and he still remembers, you know, minute details of certain P Funk sessions. I think it's a thing where most of them will hear a track. If you sat them down and 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 played a track for them, they would be like, "Oh, well, this person was doing doing this, and this person was doing that." Blah 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 blah, and I, I think that's the main way that they connect with the past. Um, I don't, and George probably works the same way. Uh, but we didn't really have the luxury of going going into the tracks like that. I'm glad he did break down the hits the way that he did, you know. Um, but it was a yeah, it was a a fantastic night, no question about it. I'd love to do it again. I'd love to do part two. Absolutely, yeah. Let's make it happen. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But some of those uh, interviews he's done uh, with you and otherwise, uh, where he just, you know, goes back into, you know, the history of not just P-Funk, but just music, period. Mm -hmm. He's such a, a treasure trove of historical information on just the whole development of 20th and 21st century music. He really does uh, put together all the cultural going on when the records, when those records were being recorded and being released, that really helps to understand the record itself. Yeah, you know? all the context, yeah. 
Right. Yeah, exactly. Though, you know, what was going on at that time, you know, his, the whole breakdown behind, you know, uh, you know, referencing uh, the play hair, you know, I don't even think that that was one thing I didn't expect to, uh, I didn't expect to cover that, but it was a great thing that he broke it down regardless. He's just so dialed in not only uh, into the history of, you know, black music, but also just all music, you know? Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. That's why you gotta be, you gotta be careful though. You, if you, you, you gotta be careful because it's like, if you, if, if you give him one question, he's going to give you eight different answers. And yet all eight answers will somehow pertain to the one question you asked. You know, I think one time I asked him something and he was like, Oh, by the way, Ruth, uh, HDH has tapes of the Ruth Copeland albums with me doing all the lead vocals. I went like, slow down. You really have to work hard to keep him focused because he'll just go on. And it's not like you don't want him to go on because when he goes on, it's just, it's, it's he's just breaking down history, you know, but you got to keep him focused, keep him, keep him locked in, you know? Yeah. But when he goes on, he's not just pointlessly digressing. I mean, he's covering all kinds of fascinating things, but yeah, that's okay. You know, that too, right? Yeah. You know, how, you know, some people, you know, they're, they're kind of like, um, like you have to almost pull an answer out of out of the out of the, out of the people you're interviewing. Absolutely. Where, whereas with him, he has diarrhea of the mouth. Keep him and Boosie. You let them talk, and they'll just talk on and on and on. And you're like, "Go ahead, please. What are you going to do? Tell them don't you know? St- you're going to stop them? No, right? Never Compared to some no. of the other cats, like a Bernie or a, or a Hampton. You know, I mean, you have to pull stuff out of those guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, and it, and and it's a thing because you know they all have something to say, but it's just that George and Boots are just ridiculously expressive about it. They're just not shy. So now, um, some things that you're going to maybe be a little frustrated about because you have to pick and choose, but uh, okay. also fun. What uh, what are your top five P Funk tracks of all time? Oh Lord, Flashlight, Insurance Man for the Funk. Knee deep. Hold on. You can't miss what you can't measure. Uh, Bootzilla. You know. Um, That's five. Yeah, but that was five. Could change tomorrow if you ask me again tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> I know. I know. You I know. know you know is. the deal. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um yeah, I was gonna ask you about Bootsy, but you threw one in there, so good. Yeah, yeah, you know. Um, I guess I just love the manic nature of Bootzilla. I don't think that record could be could go to number one at any other time other than the time that it was recorded. You know, other than the time that it was that, that it was released. At the time that P Funk could just do no wrong in terms of picking out singles. That was the time to put that type of record out, you know? And I think, you know, it's, it's great that it's so manic in, in that way. And then you come down to the summer and here comes Hollywood Squares, which is so laid back. And it has that really nice LA vibe to it. And you're like, wow, this guy can be, can, can hit you in all cylinders. This is, this is, this is just wild. Yeah, and then and then I saw the show. So with radio yeah. and Chamin and radio opening. Yeah, huh. that's it right there. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, so as that's why we so you see when you see that picture of Lucy and Ray Parker at the at the 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 company that makes Jet Magazine. You're like, wow. <laughs> this this is that this is where it's at. <laughs> This is definitely where it's at. Okay, so now uh, top five P-Funk albums. Funk and Telgi, Mothership, Let's Take to the Stage. Boosie's second album, oh, and there's Boosie Baby. And Eddie Hazel's 
games names. Okay, so just to review, you said Funk and Teleki, right. uh, games names, uh, right. Bootsy Second, right? Um, what were the other two? Let's let's take to the stage. Okay, and oh, yeah. <laughs> did you say Mothership or something else? I probably, probably Mothership. Uh, but again, subject to change day to day. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to argue with those, but interesting choice for let's take it to the stage. I mean, I love that one too, but um, really hard for me to choose between that one and probably One Nation. Isn't One Nation like the most righteous funk record ever? Oh, yeah. With good grief. The cover, the the whole vibe from the first record to the, the, from the first track to the last is just the epitome of funk righteousness. That's what really just just pulls me in whenever I listen to that 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 album. It's just so it, it's just so filled with funk righteousness. You know? And I don't think that's the I think that's the thing people don't really understand about P Funk as opposed to other funk bands. It's like that Sesame Street uh routine. One of these things is not like the others. One of the, there there are all that they, 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 they you have other bands that may play funk but they ain't playing P funk. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and I will I'll debate anybody about this, that I think that you know P Funk is definitely its own genre. And if I if I might, if I may, I'd like to explain this. When you get into a um an, a, a conversation about soul music, certain names are always gonna pop up. Uh Rarita, um, Otis Redding, Curtis Mayfield, blah, blah, blah. It's always going to be the main names. And then somewhere along the line, that conversation is going to veer into the subject of Motown, a separate and co-equal branch of black music that cannot be, that really cannot be assessed with other forms of soul music. That is exactly the way I feel about P-Funk. When you talk about funk, you're going to talk about James Sly uh, and and other uh, other you know major names, and then again, that conversation is going to steer into the subject of P funk, a separate and co equal branch of funk music that is not that cannot be assessed. Excuse me, that cannot be assessed with the regular funk genre. You just can't. It's its own entity and i found this out or i or i really came to this uh realization uh when bass player magazine did 100 years of bass and they uh they they, they broke it down <clears throat> uh, uh in, 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 into decades and within those decades they broke it down by genre and when they got to the 70s they broke it down to you know pop rock soul and then they, they and then they got to funk and then they got they said you know funk bass and then they had a section p funk bass that means you're not assessing p funk within the regular funk genre it has to be assessed on its own that is pretty much true. that's probably the reason why one of the reasons why p funk is this it, it to, to me and i think it, it could be proven a hundred times over that p funk is the standard by which all other funk bands are measured. And not just Motown stacks is kind of a similar thing too. Exactly. You know, <laughs> you know, but, but you, but I, I, but you get the point. It's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you cannot assess a P funk with everybody else. It's a completely different animal altogether. Even though many imitators, you know, are out there. Oh, yeah. They, they've tried and, and they've come up with some pretty impressive, uh, knockoffs in, in 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 some ways, but you're always going to go back to the P. <laughs> you know, you're always going to go back. You're always going to go uh, back to the source. Yeah, the imitators and, typically maybe they have one track that is, you know, like a reach for it, um, for example. But uh -huh. um, but you know, nobody, especially in any consistency, can approach B funk. You know, they can, they can, they can try to 
emulate certain aspects of the music, they're just not going to get that same kind of vibe because they don't have the same setup. They don't have a bunch of people in the studio contributing to the vibe of the music. They just they, they don't have they don't have that. They may have a, a couple of people, five six people at best, to and, and they'll and they'll try and turn out something. They may sound like P Funk, but when you get to the re- to the way that P Funk makes records, is a very chaotic situation, especially in the in the latter part of the decade when it sounds like there are fifty people on every record. <laughs> Not that there's yeah. fifty people on every track, you know. Also, just you know, we got to recognize George's touch you know i mean even when all the other acts have tried to uh do it on their own you know from the p-funk camp if george is not on the project to it me something it is missing <laughs> it's definitely missing you know right yeah, it, exactly it's just and and that's something because it's not like george is an instrumentalist it's not like he plays bass or guitar or or anything like that he you know, he um I guess the energy that is created by all those people in that studio kind of gets funneled through him. You see it, you and, and, and you see it not just in the studio, excuse me for one second. You you, you don't you don't just see it in the studio, you see it also in the live shows. You know, and I'm, I know it's somewhat orchestrated in some in, in a lot of ways, but when, they, for example, when they, you know when they're coming out and they're, and they're ripping Cosmic Slop, and then at the at the end George comes in, and that band goes into another realm. You hear it. You can you know, you know they're, they're not just they're they're pumping out that groove. Then George comes out and he, and it's, and it's, and the groove is taken somewhere else. Well, yeah, just when George comes out, the energy in the whole room. Thank changes. you. Yeah. Exactly. And he's, again, he is not an instrumentalist. And yet, when he comes out, you know, he, he you know, he, he just takes it to another realm. When he, I've seen a lot of, uh, like, I've seen a lot of musicians, you know, and they, and they, they, they either, when they meet George, or I, I'm sure you've seen, you've seen this yourself, you, you know, when you they meet, they meet George, and it's like, can you sign my guitar? That's very interesting that you're asking a non a non instrumentalist to sign your guitar. That's very interesting. You know that 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 shows you what kind of respect he gets from musicians. And I know Tim that you're uh, a fan of other music and bands as well. Oh yeah, um, and you weigh in often, you know, on the social media on different things that way. So uh, I'm going to ask you also, top five other albums. Huh, that would be hard because I think a lot of that would have that would have to be interchangeable because uh, it would probably uh, do a, a lot of Beatles would be in there, a lot of Gil Scott Heron would be in there, some Curtis Mayfield would be in there. Um, so cameo might be in there, which I you know, and that's very interesting because I I didn't realize I mean how, how many cameo records or how many Earth Wind Fire records I have in the collection. Um, I but I guess you know in terms of rock, you know I I always thought that I, I always put the Beatles at number one. Um, in terms of jazz, I put Miles and Coltrane at the top. In terms of soul. I guess, you know, um, I would probably put Marvin Gaye and Curtis Mayfield at the top. If it were, if it were say, jazz funk type thing, Gil Scott Heron is going to probably be the whole top five. Have you seen Gil Scott Heron live? Yeah, but not until the 90s. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah I saw him in the mid 80s. What a show. Wow. I saw him <laughs> in a small, um, very small venue called McCabe's in Santa Monica, California. And it was just him and the keyboard. That's it. Oh, wow. No band? No band. Just him and the keyboard. And so he did a lot of poetry. He did songs. And he did a lot of talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That must have been amazing, though. Yeah, it's like um, 50 to 100 people. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Well, how would you compare that to say Prince and his piano uh, gig? Where it was where it was him, just him, the piano. Yeah, I didn't see that tour because it didn't come to Charlotte. Oh, of course it didn't. <laughs> You know, I bet, but I bet you came to L.A., right? <laughs> uh, I think so. Yeah, I mean, it. his last show ever was in Atlanta, so it was only four hours away. Uh, yeah. Last one he ever did. So. Wow. How many, what was the first time you saw him live? 1979 at the Roxy in Hollywood, California, his first West Coast show ever. Wow. And he turned it out, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. It was funny though, because he was just wearing the bikini briefs and leg warmers and only singing falsetto. He only had the second album had just come out, and uh, some of the like brothers in the crowd were like uh, heckling him and yelling "princess" at him. And the women that were there though were swooning. Oh God! Okay. Wow. <laughs> well, then the brothers, I'm sure, ho hopefully took note of that. <laughs> You know? Yeah, well, they came around a little bit, you know, with like, uh, by controversy, I think they were all coming around for sure. Okay. You know? I got you. Okay. All right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> this was only through I Want to Be Your Lover era. See, uh, yeah, I, I, the first time I saw him uh, was at a gig that was later uh, thoroughly um, bootlegged. You may, you, you may have heard it. It was a gig that he did in Holland. Oh, the second show that night is the name of the bootleg. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was it, it was Holland, May 27th. The only reason why I remember because of my birthday. May 27th, 1992. My girlfriend got me tickets for that gig as a birthday present. You know, and it was a good show. It was a very it was a good a very good show. So, were you living out there? Or you just traveled or what? Uh, I was just there to visit her. Oh. Yeah, I've been to Holland like four times. Okay, I've never been yeah. to Europe. Oh wow, is it something something you 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 would love to do? Well, it was definitely the 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 time to do it was definitely the nineties because Bill Clinton kept that dollar strong in Europe to the degree that you could get two guilders for every dollar. That was a great thing, <laughs> especially when you were hitting those CD shops in Amsterdam. Oh man, yeah. Okay, <laughs> definitely. Were any of those Japanese uh, P Funk releases out at that point? Oh, that they were definitely deep. And there was one store that had almost like nothing but, you know, and um, it was great to be able to go there and, and pick up some stuff. That was it was really nice. In fact, Holland had a place uh, a place called Donner. That's I guess they they basically started that whole concept of the bookstore, uh, cafe, record store. You know, we I, we we tried. We, I guess they tried to you know uh, uh, copy it here in the states, but it was never as it wasn't as full fledged. Because in Holland, they had at like three floors. The Adana had three floors: one record store, one CD, one, one uh, bookstore, one cafe. It was all separate. It wasn't like you go into a bookstore now and you see a whole bunch of books and a cafe on the side and a record stand in the middle. You know, it, was, it wasn't like that. It was like full fledged on all three levels. Hmm. That just jogged my memory about um, something now that just escaped me. I'm so glad you're just as old as I am. <laughs> yeah, so it's also glad. late in the day. Uh, people need to know as we're doing this, it's after a full day of work and everything. So Right, 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 exactly. But yeah, yeah. It's only for the love of the funk, baby. That's right. Exactly. We could talk about this all day, and we're not even listening to the music while we talk about it. Imagine if we were listening to the music while we were talking about it. Yeah. Well, that's another thing that you were talking about with some of those documentaries, you know, YouTube with their copyrights too and the algorithms and stuff. You can't, you know, I've had a lot of challenges playing music on the shows I do, but that's another thing. Do they really go after you like that? Yeah, it's pretty intense. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I have those shows that I did in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, uh, music review shows called Platter Chatter. At the time when I did them, one of them, by the way, you know, has a corporate thing band reviewed and I show their video. But um, when I was doing those, I had full uh, 
the audio got weird in your end. I had full um, blessing from the record labels. They actually gave me the videos. They gave me the music. You know, it was all on the up and up, and they had full credits on the shows. But on YouTube, they get they don't allow them. Even you know, so oh, that's um, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's intense. Um, wow. Oh. See, I, 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 I mean, I guess I know how you feel because a lot of times when I do those, the mixes on, the, uh, on, I mean, when I do the turntable mixes, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll, they, they, they try to go after you, like you know, yeah, no, no, this is something we own and we, and you can't play this. They tried, and, and, and but one time I got revenge on them because I was doing some mix and I was using One Nation or Knee Deep or one of the one of the Funkadelic Warner Brothers releases, and, and Warner Brothers or Warner Music tried to come after me after that. I was like, no. You don't you, you don't own this anymore. Sorry, <laughs> you can't, can't do it. And and they, and they actually had to back off because they didn't own it. <laughs> yeah, all right. You know, yeah. Score score one for the resistance, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, those record those recordings went through a lot of hands for a couple yeah. of decades there. Oh yeah, good grief! And it's and and it's still not out in the way that they should be. Out, you know. And that's my next, uh, uh, as we're getting near the end here, Tim, I want to ask you, what are some of your fantasy P-Funk releases that might see the light of day? Oh, boy. Any of my fantasy releases won't, I know won't ever see the light well, of day. Well, no, I mean, it's maybe something that may surface at some point, but, you know, if you were in control of stuff that hasn't been released, stuff that you'd like to see remastered, box sets that don't exist. What are a few that would be like right at the top of your list? Uh, the Beverly Theater Show complete. Unedited with Bootsy's body, body slam as well. Who wouldn't want that? Mm -hmm. um, there were some shows featured on those four CD live sets that I would love to have the complete show of. Particularly the Monroe Civic Center gig from April 15th, 1978. I would love to have the complete uh, performance because the performance of Mothership Connection that you find on those sets, on one of those sets, is just so deep and so tribal and so and it's, it's tribal and spiritual at the same time. It's, one, it's probably one of the best versions of Mothership Connection I've ever heard. Um... Uh, outside of that, I mean, hell, wouldn't we want to? Wouldn't you want to? I'm, I'm sorry. Wouldn't you want to have the complete Parliament Live package of a complete Oakland show and a complete LA show? Who wouldn't want that? That's you know, that would be ridiculous. I would also love to see a, a totally remastered version of Boosie's performance at the LA Funk Festival in 1977. Because that's probably the best Bootsy live performance I've ever heard in my life. That's some pretty tantalizing stuff right there, for sure. Oh, let's forget about it. Oh, I would love to. I would love for all that to surface. Unfortunately, I and I hate to say this, I don't. I don't know if that stuff will ever come out in our lifetimes. You know, but you can. But hell, we can wish. We can dream. <laughs> Definitely dream. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, also just think of how much footage must be somewhere there, like, you know, what uh, was pulled out for Summer of Soul for those acts, you know, but stuff that's got P-Funk from back in the day, you know, during their heyday. At the Funk Festival from 77, that would be ridiculous. To, you know, somebody has to call Questlove and tell him, this is just as important as Summer of Soul, if not more. Because all those people in Summer of Soul all had crossover hits, the, the, the vast majority of them. Whereas those funk fan, those funk uh, festivals, the the the, um, the main attraction is playing to an uh, uh, to a non crossover audience. You know that that's that is that 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 goes back to how much of a phenomenon P funk is. They are they are filling stadiums and arenas with virtually no crossover audience. That's hugely significant. When you talk, I talked when I talked to Bruce Talamon when he when he put out that book. You know, he was he was there at the Funk Festival taking a whole bunch of shots, and he was like, and you know, I asked him, 
uh, you know, the, the the percentage of whites that were at that show. He was like zero point five. That's it right there. I huh? I believe I believe I was the lone one at that seventeen thousand forum Bootsy show in seventy eight. Um. Sh- yeah, well, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't you know. see. I didn't see a single other, and it was sold out for sure. So, wow. Yeah. And and, and it was a and it was a great vibe all around, wasn't it? Oh, it definitely was. Except for there was a dude very close to me that was completely tripping out on angel dust. Oh Lord, it's, that's isn't it? That's always it. That's always the case. Always. Always one dude that's tripping out more than everybody else. Yeah. Uh, you know what I would love to see too is you know imagine if they had video of that um, airplane hangar show uh, rehearsal. Oh lord, yes, right, right. You know, like the, like a complete show. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. the mothership on that too. That you know that would be that would be fantastic. And I and 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 I thought I always thought to myself, did they ever do? A, uh, a, a hanger show with Bootsy, but I asked Mudbone, and he said they didn't do one. Hmm. You know, but you know, we can still, we can still, we can still, we can still hope for the best, I guess. <laughs> well, when you, you talk know? about the P Funk Earth tour, you know, complete show, uh, just remastering that too would just be, I mean, oh, it's yeah. so much in need. Yes, yes, I think the Japanese. Pressing is a is is a little it, it, it's a bit of an improvement, but yeah, you're right. I mean, I I guess I, you know for me, I still get a lot out of that record when I play it because you know I'm playing it on a full body stereo system, which is what you're supposed to do with a record like that. You're not supposed to listen to it through the computer, and I still get a a, a rush out of that record, even with the slightly compromised recording that it is. Oh, no doubt. Um, but also, there's not much else to compete with it that's been released um, from that era. Um, you know. You mean from the, other bands or from P-Funk? From P-Funk. Yeah, oh, you know, there's some bootlegs, but, you know, not commercially released. And I think at the time, they kind of rushed it out and maybe didn't, you know, take as much care with the remastering of it and that kind of thing. Well, then uh, let me ask you this, then. What do you think of, for example, the all right, all right, let's let's take for example the San Diego show from 1977, featured on the Fourth City Live set. Do you think that's a better sounding recording? Off the top of my head, I have to go back and listen to it again with that in mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know. By the way, okay. I'm 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 a bit ashamed to say, uh, and I'm and. It's been bugging me for for years, but I don't have the Japanese version of that. Ah, uh, okay. I have the other right. two. Yeah, right, right. And the Japanese version is the one that has that Hampton, Virginia, nineteen seventy eight show in its entirety. Hmm. So that would be something you definitely want to have. I've peeked at eBay on that a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's it's not cheap. Two things that just popped in my mind that I really like to have is that, and also that um, covers book that um, what's his name put out um, the hardcover. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know that goes for a pretty penny too on eBay if you find it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I guess you know between you and I, we can just listen, look into, our, look in our old collections. <laughs> you know, there's some, there's a lot, there's some, there's some stuff in there we might not have, but the vast majority of we have it. <laughs> You know, and I, I'm pretty sure none of those gold records that are behind you are in that book. <laughs> so there you go. Hmm. Well, now when you see George, it's just really like family, right? It is. It is. And it's like, I don't, well, I know there's going to be a time when, his, when he is not going to be with us. That's why I'm trying to, uh, see this man and and see this band as many times as i can in the time that god has been has gifted us you know um i i don't even care i, I don't care if his voice is not is shot or whatever else i don't care about that he can sit there he can go into the or in, into the uh, on the stage and stand in the middle of the stage and 
I'll still give him a standing ovation because he's George Clinton. Amen. Exactly. Yeah. I saw him last time there in Charlotte. It was about a year ago. I guess okay. I, you didn't come up for that. I don't think. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, that was the first one I saw with um, Kevin Oliver. and. Um, that's that's a ridiculous thing. <laughs> Get him out. of. They got him. They pulled him out of the past, didn't they? Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and, and there were no girls at the show at the that show oh really yeah man it's been so cool to catch up with you and likewise man i did the, the time flew didn't it <laughs> it did yeah but i'm glad we did this and i'm glad i'm very glad to see what you what you do with the truth and rhythm and what you're doing now with the with the new format thank you for doing this this is just that this is something us aging aging funk junkies need right right about now hey my pleasure thanks tim and um man i hope to see you in the near future in the flesh absolutely when we get p-funk down here you'll be the one of the first people to know <laughs> there you have it so good to be uh spending time again with my great friend tim kinley from way back another dedicated funketeer thank you for hanging in there to the conclusion i hope you enjoyed this episode of where'd you get your funk from that you make it part of your routine viewing please subscribe to the funk stuff channel and like, share, and comment on episodes. Also, be sure to set your notification alert so you never miss when a video posts. The usual schedule is new show world premieres on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Then it's added to the FunkinStuff.net website on Wednesdays and subsequently available as audio-only podcasts on Thursdays. I encourage you to reach out to me anytime at scottg at funkinstuff.net with comments, ideas, or guest requests. If you can, please support this channel through YouTube's monetary features, submit donations at funkinstuff.net, buy awesome apparel of your favorite musical artists, as well as exclusive Where'd You Get Your Funk From gear at the Funkinstuff store. You can also get my book, Everything is on the One, The First Guy to Funk, at Amazon. I thank you sincerely for your interest and support. For now, until next time, this is Scott Dr. G. Skolfine asking, where'd you get your funk from? <laughs>